I'm going to go through a lot of stuff in the next 40 minutes or so, um, and I hope that will be provocative. If you have things that just make no sense whatsoever, uh, put a hand up and stop me during it, but we'll hopefully leave time for some discussion afterwards. Um, and it's going to include a slideshow, a video, and other things of that kind. Um, and I won't talk specifically about the cultural plan, but there are clearly a lot of connections, I hope, between the work we're doing in innovation, adaptive change, and sustainability, and the plan's interest in those topics, and in public participation, and new forms of cultural participation. So maybe in our discussion we'll look for more of those connections. Um, but let me start with just a, a few stories. Um, the Civilians is a small Brooklyn-based theatre company, about a budget of $350,000, that had for a long time done um, site-specific theatre in communities around the country. They went into a community and worked with local citizens to really surface the hot topics and major stories of that community, then turned them into a play and presented it in that community and took it on tour. So they had a tremendously close engagement with that community during the period they were creating the play, but once they'd created it and went on tour, they had really no connection with the community. So the issue for the civilians was, how can we maintain our engagement with communities after we've created our show? They came into our innovation lab to explore that question and came up with an approach which they prototyped through a, a new uh, play, a new thematic um, project called The Divorce Project. Got to start somewhere. They went into a community and they asked people to tell them the story of their parents' divorce. And from these various stories, they made a play. It's called uh, You'd Better Sit Down. It's hilarious, actually. Um, and they took this on tour. But this time, when they did the play, they videoed it and cut it up into 10-minute webisodes, put each of those webisodes, one per character and story, up on the web, and invited everybody who had contributed and others in different cities to comment and contribute their own stories and develop what they saw and heard and, and read. And from all that, they were able to download new material, create a new version of the play, which are then presented in more cities and put up on webisodes and had people... So they created this system, which has proven to be really effective, of maintaining engagement uh, through using this combination of real-time and, and online uh, activities. Uh, to such an extent, their next project, which was the one at the bottom here, The Great Immensity, it's about climate change, got them a huge grant, like double their operating budget, from the National Science Foundation. Not so much because of the topic, but because of the way they had found to engage communities around the country in thinking about these issues over the long haul. So this, what, this new form of uh, theatre for them became a major source of grants and ultimately of support from their patrons around the country. The Memphis Symphony Orchestra is a mid-sized orchestra that about seven years ago made a small but really telling change in its uh, mission statement. If you know the mission statements of most American orchestras, they tend to be something like, we're going to perform the best music in the world to the most people we can at the highest possible quality as often as possible. That's the general kind of statement. Well, the Memphis Symphony went in a different direction. They, they now say that their job is to create meaningful experiences for the citizens of Memphis through music. It's that little shift that makes music the means, not the end, that really opened doors in the community for the orchestra. When they then looked at how they could implement that mission, they found all sorts of partners in the community because instead of going out and just saying, well, could we play our music in your space? They were saying, how can we work with you to, to address the issues and the agenda that you have? And one of the doors that opened was at FedEx. They'd had a relationship with FedEx as a sponsor of their concerts, but not a big one. But FedEx was really interested in leadership development for its middle and senior managers. So the orchestra created a program. It's called Leading from Every Chair which is a leadership development program that uses the orchestra as the means by which the FedEx managers learn about leadership responsibilities and behaviors. What's interesting in a way is that the program was created entirely by the musicians of the orchestra, who then of course perform and engage with the FedEx staff in doing this. You'll see a FedEx senior manager conducting at that point. This was a great success with FedEx, and they now use it with many of their different branches around the country, and it's been exported to a lot of other companies. So it's become a significant revenue stream, uh, fee for services for the orchestra. And in fact, they tell me now that the musicians of the orchestra were so empowered by the role they had in creating this that they've gone out and created another 10 or 12 community-based programs working with partners in the community. So they now reach three times as many people through these community programs as they do through their core concert season and they bring in about 15% of their revenue by doing these. The Performing Arts County of LA, uh, Performing Arts Center of LA County is 
a sort of poster child for new ways of doing things. You know it as the Music Center, probably, at the top of Grand Avenue in downtown Los Angeles, right next to Disney Hall, the Mark Taper Forum, the Dorothy Chandler Pavilion, great palaces of culture that for decades have put on terrific work. But again, about seven or eight years ago, the staff of the Music Center began to realize that they were in an area of Los Angeles that was basically deserted after hours or when there was no event on. Their plazas that surround the music center were completely empty unless people were either coming to a performance or leaving it. The civic footprint, if you will, of the music center was very small. So they began to experiment with participatory events. They put down a dance floor on the plaza of a Wednesday evening. They put up lights, they arranged music, and they invited people to come and dance. Not to attend a dance performance, but to come and dance. Different styles, different evenings. And soon there were two and three and four hundred people turning up to dance on a Wednesday evening. So they expanded it to different days of the week. They expanded it to lunchtime. And they expanded it to other art forms. They started storytelling circles. They started a drumming circle. They started a get your chops back orchestra. If you were once a, an amateur musician and you were rusty, you could come and rehearse and perform with others who are in the same situation. They even started a, a huge flute choir, which is a reformed flute player, I can tell you, is the, you know, the worst noise you'll ever <laughs> likely hear, I think. But these were such successes. There were thousands of people coming to the plazas around the music center. So they began to be worried that they wouldn't get their place on the dance floor. They wouldn't get their place in the story circle. And people said, I want to register to get my place. So they introduced a registration fee, $5 at first. Now they're 35 to $50. And still the numbers go on up. And now there are thousands of people in all these different activities. And downtown Los Angeles and the plazas are now occupied and full of artistic happenings most days of the week. Even more interesting, in a way, in the, in the last couple of years, uh, the county decided to re redo the park, which is opposite the Music Centre, the Civic Park in the centre of town, and they offered it to the Music Centre for programming. Um, and the board of the Music Centre voted, and these are some of the most eminent trustees in the arts in Los Angeles, voted that all the programming in the park should be active arts, which is what they call the programme. It should all be participatory active arts programming. So now, and the park opened actually a couple of months ago, now you find that there are millions of dollars coming directly in from the county to support this active arts approach to participation. And I would reckon in the next couple of years you'll see this become one of the signature programs of the Music Centre. And what's intriguing about Active Arts when it started is actually how little it cost. Yeah. Because apart from putting down the dance floor or the lights, you know, um, this was not a big revenue, uh, sorry, a big expense drain for the, for, the, uh, for the music center. And now it's ended up increasing even the money they get from, from the county. So my question in a way for today is what's going on here? Why are all these organizations from small theater companies to major well-heeled presenters um, doing things differently, doing things they've never done before? And I want to suggest that we're entering and we're pretty far into a new era for the arts in which I do think the values and the approaches we take, not just to what we perform or our programs, but to the very structures of our organizations uh, are changing and are going to have to change if we're going to thrive in the future. The old era, I think, was, if you will, structured for growth. The old era began in the 1950s, particularly with the, with the entry of the Ford Foundation as the first national philanthropy to put money on the table in massive amounts for the arts, the performing arts, but also uh, visual and literary arts over time. It wasn't just that Ford put masses of money into it, literally billions of dollars at today's rates. It was that they had a particular strategy, which was then copied and expanded by a lot of the agencies that came into being after that, the NEA in 1965, the State Arts Councils and so on, and by many other foundations. So Ford had a, an influence on the field, I think, which was out of all proportion to the, even to the money they gave. And it set in the field a lot of norms, which I think we've taken for granted for 50 years and are only now beginning to question. For instance, they put Danny Newman from the Lyric Opera here in Chicago on the road to create the idea of subscription selling 
And it became an orthodoxy in the performing arts field that that's the way you built loyalty among your patrons. They developed the idea of the annual campaign. Most of Ford's grants were matching grants, three to one matching grants often. So they created the idea that we have to have an annual development campaign to make the Ford match. This was very common parlance. It also meant that trustees became seen as the fundraisers, the donors and solicitors for funds to make those matches. And as time went on, Ford moved its grants gradually towards sustainability or particularly permanence and longevity in the organizations it had helped grow. And so it moved into endowment funding. And again, often with three to one matches and often with endowments that were multiples of the operating budgets of these organizations. You have to imagine the massive influence of that huge amount of financial pressure and financial opportunity. Now, much of this was very brilliantly conceived. And to be about growth at a time when the art sector was becoming established as a professional sector, where it was expanding beyond the metropolitan centers to create access across the country, was a natural thing to do. Out of it came some curious side effects, like the, the value proposition, I think, that was sustained during that time, I say, was about excellence and scarcity, because there was a degree of quality of programming that many had not had access to before. But at the same time, there was a sense that we were taking artists from our communities and bringing them together in ensembles of unprecedented uh, quality, and then selling them back to our communities at the highest ticket prices those communities could afford. And there was an element of scarcity that's almost inevitably linked to excellence that I think was under, underlying all of this first phase of the arts. And it's a phase that I think is now decisively over. And I think we're now having to be, as I put it, structured for resilience not for growth. This means, I think, some very different qualities to our arts organizations and to what we do. It means, I think, that organizations have to develop much higher levels of adaptive capacity, the, the capacity to change effectively and respond to outside circumstances, much less a supply-side dynamic to one that's more balanced, perhaps. It means engaging with the creative potential in our communities in new ways. Those of you who study or follow the NEA's surveys of public participation will know of the famous one they did a few years ago, the most recent, where they expanded the range of activities that they looked at beyond the legacy or benchmark activities to things which might take place in churches, synagogues, community centers, at home. And they found that three quarters of Americans say that the arts play a role in their lives, an important one, but only 34% do so through a professional arts organization, and only 8% exclusively through a professional arts organization. So you could argue there's a vast territory of creative interest and endeavor that is not connected to the professional arts sector. In some ways, through this first phase in the arts, we've painted ourselves uh, into a relatively small corner of the country's artistic life. The question now is, can we expand that? Can we develop beyond that to have a more central role uh, in American expressive lives, I think? This means much more open and nimble structures uh, and Sam Jones, who writes for Demos, he's a cultural researcher in London, recently wrote that the role of the cultural professional is changing from a model of provision to one of enabling, which I think sums up much of what's got to shift and is shifting in the arts sector. This means a very different value proposition. The way I put it now is that it's going to be about abundance and intimacy and a recognition and celebration of the abundance of creative talents and interest in our communities, and a kind of customer intimacy, which is perhaps commonplace in other sectors, but not, I think, been one of the driving factors uh, in the arts field so much in the past. Another way of looking at this might be to say that arts organizations used to feel that the way forward as you grew, a bit like a sunflower, was to focus on stability of that long stalk as you grew up into, into the higher reaches of the atmosphere. And we developed all sorts of techniques to help organizations with that idea of stability. All these kinds of muscles in our arts organizations, technical competencies in marketing, development, operations, and so on. Strong staff hierarchies, command and control cultures, which we essentially inherited from a 1950s corporate model, were really the norm in the sector. And we backed it up with strategic planning, which entered the field in the 1970s, I think, in real earnest, and was a really sensible strategy when you expected the future to look like the past, only more so, but which is now coming under question because you can't really predict out much more than six months in many ways. And we underpinned it with capital endowments and fixed assets. To grow up as an arts organization was to get a building. And look what happened in that area. Now I think what's happened is we've realized there's a whole other axis to this graph, which I call adaptability. There's a whole other set of muscles that organizations have to develop 
if they're going to thrive, I think, in the future. For instance, the leadership which we've often thought of as heroic, there's one individual who gives us our vision and we move forward, is giving way to adaptive leadership. The problems now are so wicked, the challenges are so complex, that no single individual is going to be able to address them. We need to bring people together in teams and mobilize them to work in different ways. We need cross-functional teamwork then to a much higher degree than we have in the past and we need to develop much more collaborative cultures. The issue used to be differentiation, now it's about critical mass I think. And instead of strategic planning, at least in the traditional forms, I think we're now looking at continuously incubating innovations. We're looking to find where we need to adapt and how we can become really proficient in our adaptive strategies. And instead of focusing on endowments and buildings, we need to focus on liquidity and change capital, putting capital on our balance sheets, which is available to invest in new ventures as we move forward. These are at least some of the new muscles that I think arts organizations are learning as they move forward. And I want to stress, it's not a question of throwing out the baby with the bathwater. It's not shifting from the one to the other. It's finding a new balance between the two. And every organization will find the balance, I think, which is appropriate for that one. If they do, and if the sector as a whole does, then I think the trajectory of our public value and impact will continue to rise. But in recent years, there have been real questions, I think, about that trajectory. I would say it's kind of plateaued. It may even be dropping. If you remember back to 2008 and the stimulus package, that seems a while ago now, the arts really struggled to get any traction with the federal government. We eventually got $50 million for the NEA alongside roadside beautification. We were seen as being at that kind of level of importance. We have to make a stronger case, and we do so, I think, by balancing these two. When the cultural plan here talks about the arts organizations wanting stability and sustainability, to me, they're two different things. And sustainability is about the balance between stability and adaptability. If you look at organizations, I can't take a graph like this without dividing it into four quadrants and thinking about what are you know, the organizations in each quadrant. And what's interesting from my perspective, working with hundreds of organizations across the country, is the ones that are proving to be really capable in both these dimensions, what we call the new leaders, are not an easy or obvious subgroup of the whole. They're not the big organizations. They're not the small ones. They're not in any one discipline. They're not old or young, big or small. They're a whole mix of organizations that are turning out to have that requisite balance between sufficient organizational stability and sufficient adaptability to be really capable of delivering public impact. And I think we're also seeing uh, more than I've seen since I've worked here, uh, organizations that are really struggling on both of these dimensions. We're seeing a lot of them go out of business, cancel seasons, and really struggle to find a way forward. We're also seeing organizations that are up in this top left-hand quadrant that are relatively stable, but are really struggling to adapt. I hate to typecast, but I do see a lot of orchestras and museums, and a lot of collecting institutions that have a preservation of a tradition really struggling to move across from this top right quadrant. And then on the bottom, sorry, top left, on the bottom right, we have organizations that haven't got the stability at this time to be able to capitalize upon their innate adaptive abilities. We see a lot of dance companies down in this bottom right-hand quadrant, I think. I want to offer just a little bit of terminology that we're finding is useful for this new era and to understand the kinds of challenges that arts organizations uh, are facing. We take this distinction from Ron Heifetz, a professor at the Kennedy School of Government at Harvard, who's written a lot about adaptive leadership and about adaptive challenges. He distinguishes them from technical challenges, which he suggests are those kinds of challenge which organizations routinely face in which they can generally solve it by improving what they're doing, by improving their current strategies. They don't need a breakthrough change. They just need to perhaps bring in a consultant, get up to date with best practices and find the right way to move towards those. Those are very common and we're used to those every day in our work in the arts. We go into work looking to improve what we do. But Heifetz suggests we're living through a time where adaptive challenges are becoming much more prevalent and it's certainly what I see across the country. And these are challenges that there isn't a technical solution for, where you have in fact to change the way you think change something fundamentally about your business in order to be able to find a new way forward. One of the issues is how do you tell the difference? Uh, and Heifetz, I think, has quite a nice line on that. He says, if you throw all the technical fixes you can at the problem and it persists, it's a pretty sure sign that there's an underlying adaptive challenge you haven't yet met. So often we find it's those persistent challenges that you may have thought you'd dealt with, but which keep coming back. Equally, I think it's those areas where you find you've got no strategy at all like social media five years ago. A few arts organizations had a, 
a strong social media strategy. You need to do something different, something you've never done before. And that really means shifting your organizational assumptions. For us, this is the roots of innovation. Uh, all organizations develop some of these kind of you know, underlying assumptions that drive your business forward. They begin as uh, propositions, ideas about success. If we do that, it'll be successful. And if it isn't, you drop it. But if it is, you may tweak it a bit, but it becomes part of the way you do business. If you're a new theatre company, you decide, this is the size of the house, we'll price it in these three tiers in this way. That'll maximise revenue and maximise attendance. You try it. You might tweak it a bit, but you arrive at something which works. And as far as you're concerned, that's an assumption we'll carry forward. It becomes part of who we are and the way we do things. Edgar Schein, great writer on organisational culture, puts this very well, I think. He says... If assumptions evolve as repeated successful solutions to problems, what was once a hypothesis we could test and question becomes a reality we take for granted. These assumptions drop down out of consciousness and just become part of the way we do things. I am always interested that when you raise an assumption or you hit on an assumption that people have got implicitly, they often get rather hot under the collar. You can say, maybe that shiny new building we just built um, is a barrier to some people and there are in fact other modes of involvement that have higher levels of artistic control by the participant interpretative arts participation, for instance, where you actually perform the work, or inventive, where you create it. And going in the other direction, of course, ambient is all those arts experiences we all have every day because we can't help it. It's the music in the elevator. It's the art show you see on the travelator at the airport as you go past. So whatever these different forms of participation are, the issue I'm seeing is not that arts organizations are shifting from one to another, but they're making decisions around the idea that they can open up doorways of participation across all these different modes. And fundamental artistic decisions are being made that support a wider range of doorways into the arts. Many organizations we're working with, I think, are trying to address the fundamental problem that's neatly captured by this New York uh, cartoon of a few months ago. This is the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York. And you know, the. The issue, in a way, I think, is how many of our arts organizations have that banner on their buildings implicitly, and how many wear it with pride? Innovation is extending across all sorts of areas of practice. Here's a long list of a lot of them. You'll see the first four of those are all about new forms of participation. But it's also, I think, about the role of artists. In many ways, I think our creative artists were sequestered in our organizations to be only about creation and production. But artists are tremendous lateral thinkers, great organizational problem solvers. And what we're finding, and we in insist on artists being part of the teams in our programs, is that artists can make tremendous contributions, not representing the programmatic point of view, but as full organizational members, actually solving the institutional issues and problems that organizations are faced with. And this means restructuring in many ways to meet the new demands and the new ways of doing business. We're seeing a lot of partnerships and mergers uh, on a level that I haven't seen before because they're looking for critical mass and joint action. I wanted to show you just quickly a, a video by one of the organizations we worked with recently, the Denver Center Theatre Company. We do profiles of organizations that come through our innovation lab. And the Denver Center Company created a program called Off Center at the Jones. So I thought I'd just share with you um, a seven minute video about that project because in some ways I think it encapsulates a lot of the changes that I've just been talking about across the organization, not just programming, but about capacity and approach to public participation. So if you'll excuse me coming out of the PowerPoint, I'll go into the, if this works, it'll be a miracle. I'm sure it'll work. We really want the work that we're doing in the Jones to be at the forefront and to be sort of blazing a new trail in Denver and hopefully nationally in a, a new type of theater that is not your mom's theater or not your grandma's theater. And that's part of the identity we're trying to create with Off Center. The 
The Denver Center Theater Company is the flagship resident professional theater in the Rocky Mountain region. We want to make the theater relevant, thought-provoking, moving. We produce an 11 or 12 show season on our main stage, not counting what we're going to do in the Jones. We have this huge complex that is intimidating and is a barrier for some people to attend the theater. We have this theater, the Jones, and it was underutilized. So we wanted to use the Jones as a new entry point for a new audience and also for um, the next generation of theater artists. Part of the goal of our project was to have the younger staff sort of leading it and Emily and I um, became the, the team leaders. It's very important to me that, 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 that I be there because also I would have to go back to the larger theater and explain what was going on and say, okay, this is important to our future. Tonight I think we had kind of a breakthrough in talking about our audience because we've kind of dappled a lot with is it demographic, is it age, and we kind of said tonight it's people that would feel comfortable in a more adventurous situation, whoever that is. We spent all of phase one doing a lot of research and questioning what we were trying to do. Uh, we, it was challenging at times because we would ask ourselves all these questions and question every assumption behind everything that we had on the table. I have a feeling that we've got an idea of where we want to be by March 2011. We still don't know how we're going to get there or what it's going to look like, but there is a sense of like direction. I feel like I'm used to having an idea and doing it. So to have this week where I'm not focused on my other job and I'm just focused on this has been a really great challenge. We have figured out a case statement that we can take back to use internally and externally. A kind of contextual statement about, okay, why are we doing this? Why are we using the Jones, the theater we want to do? And what do we want to do in there? The second part of that is a recipe for how we would select programming, events, uses of the Jones Theater. And we've picked five or six adjectives that really express what we're looking for. Immersive, convergent, connective, inventive, and now. We have a big task ahead of us changing the culture of where we are and and trying to get a lot of people that will support the project when we go home so that we so that it has a chance to survive and thrive and take off. At the intensive we identified three different prototype events that we wanted to create to test out different elements of the recipe. First prototype we ended up becoming the ultimate Wii baseball game. We really wanted to test the immersive ingredient, so we created this event, we turned the Jones into a baseball stadium, we played Wii on the big screen, we had live play-by-play -play commentators, a jumbotron, a mascot. People didn't observe the regular rules of theater. They were climbing on the seats, they were getting on stage to play Wii. It really proved that the immersive ingredient is something that people can get excited about and want and something that can be successful. Our second event was working with uh, a reading that we had, workshop that we had scheduled during the New Play Summit. Ladies and gentlemen, the marvels of modern science! The character of Tesla never appears in the play, but only appears to the audience through headsets. We used a uh, electronic texting polling technique where audience members could actually vote on a series of questions and see on a screen in front of them as their responses changed. It really taxed our resources and we discovered that using that many technologies in one performance was maybe financially and human resource wise uh, too difficult. I think what we learned is that the listening devices were not necessarily um, engaging the audience in the process. Our third prototype was called Hip Hop Jambalaya and it was a showcase of local hip hop talent. We broke hip hop into its ingredients and then we put it all together 
in this jambalaya pot of the Jones Theater. I would like to think we really tested all of the recipe. It was very cool to see that we could have that kind of liveliness and excitement. I think it's still a struggle for us, you know, logistically. How do we reach out to people through non-traditional marketing? How do we get them invested in the show beyond just an audience member? To constantly be thinking outside of traditional structures is challenging. The prototypes really taught us a lot that was really useful testing it out on the smaller scale and now we're gearing up for our first full season of programming that we're going to call Off Center here in the Jones next season. We've gotten out of the board of trustees a hundred thousand dollar pledge toward the programming in the Jones Theater and we're trying to figure out how we can work, uh, create a new model for producing I would say. I really hope that off center becomes an opportunity for the whole organization to experiment um, from every department. Ultimately, I think, you know, we are creating sort of this next generation of audiences in that as we find what's appealing to them, uh, you know, our main stage uh, in response can be more appealing to them. We have a door that's open now. Maybe it's, maybe it's down the alley and there's this double door that's much more interesting and it's it's, it's, it's much more colorful, but there's another way for people to come in here rather than they have to go through the big gate. Then the Center Theatre Company. <clears throat> One of the things I find interesting about, about that is um, beyond the, the first season that they're talking about putting together there, um, they're now in their second season, and the, the board has pledged a lot more money, and they've matched it in the community, altogether about 1.2 million, I think, towards the off-center doing a full season. And in another experiment, their new experiment, Kent Thompson, the artistic director whom you heard there, has invited the production team from off-center to do one of the main stage productions uh, on their in their biggest theater in the coming season. So it'll be an interesting experiment around beginning to institutionalize or integrate uh, an innovation rather than letting it just be a marginal extra. Will it destroy it? Will it bring the audience with it? Uh, we don't know yet, but that's, that remains to be seen. One of the things I think that video helps us see is that, in fact, innovation can be systematized. And that's the thing I just wanted to end with, uh, because our work wouldn't be much use of it if it couldn't. Um, but a lot of people think it can't, you know? A lot of people, I think, confuse innovation with creativity. And I think they're quite different. Creativity is a, 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 a talent, a tenet of individuals. Some people are just naturally good at coming up with original ideas. And it's really important to have creative thinkers in your team, but they're not sufficient because innovation is about turning creative ideas into practical strategies that organizations can implement. And that means people working together. It's a group activity. So while you need creative thinkers, you've also got to have the, the muscles, the capacities, and the very team uh, to be able to turn that into uh, a strategy that's unlike what you've done before. Um, and for that reason, we'd see innovation as an organizational discipline, something that every organization can learn. There aren't naturally innovative organizations. It's something you can actually learn. And we were, we were pleased when a few years ago, uh, the Kellogg Foundation came up with a report. It was the first major report on innovation in the nonprofit sector called Intentional Innovation. And it confirmed, or at least it came to the conclusion, that innovation indeed should be a core competency of not-for-profit organizations. It called innovation a, a rational organizational process with its own distinct procedures and processes and so on. And it's on that assumption, that belief, that we've built our various programs. We've developed what we call a system framework for innovation because what we discovered when we started this is that there's no lack of creative ideas, but because of the nature of working in the nonprofit sector, business as usual tends to kind of gradually crush all efforts to do things differently. And after about five months or so, the effort just runs out of steam, unless there's a framework to propel and focus it over time. So that's what we try to provide. It's in eight different sections, if you like, though it's nothing like as distinct and clear as I'm making it sound now. But it's important to begin by those, that questioning of assumptions that Charlie Miller, you saw on the video, talking about so that you identify a genuinely adaptive challenge, to build a team that can address that. 
in our work we require that the organisations include board members, staff members, artists and outsiders on the team. And you'll see in the case of Denver that Kent Thompson deliberately put his younger staff members as the team leaders because they were the demographic they were trying to achieve. Very non-traditional approach to a major, a major issue. And they recruited members of some of those artistic ensembles they worked with in the prototypes to be on the team as well as outsiders. Then you begin to develop your innovative strategies. And if you can get that far, you go through a process in which you begin to strengthen the overall adaptive capacities of the organization to support the innovation. And we recommend a project accelerator. Because of that problem that after about five months things tend to run out of steam, we try to telescope the next six months of meetings into an intensive five-day retreat that you saw the Denver Center people going on. So you can really push through the challenges and difficulties and come up with a plan to prototype. And that's the, the other big thing we put an emphasis on, is the idea of prototyping. You heard Emily there saying, I'm used to having an idea and just doing it. And in the arts, that's really, I think, how it generally is. We have an idea, somebody writes it up into a grant proposal, we shop it around, and eventually someone gives us the money, so we just do it. Actually, we generally get about half the money, and we still do it. Right? Uh, but we don't have any room to manage the risk by doing small experiments and prototypes in low-stakes environments where we can try out aspects of the new strategy, evaluate them to death, improve it before we finally launch. And that's what prototyping is all about. And we put a huge emphasis on that in our programs. And then finally, if you do get to a point where you've come up with a strategy that really could have legs, you have to enroll others and get the whole organization to begin to adapt and change in the way I think Denver is, is trying to do. Now, I wish this was a lovely linear process, but even in trying to represent it simply, I'm aware of the fact there are lots of loops built into this. You know, you might think you've got an innovative strategy, but find, in fact, you haven't done enough questioning of assumptions. You need to go back round and start again. Your, your strategy turned out to be really just incremental. You might actually do prototypes and realize we've got to change the, the strategy. You might even do successful prototypes and change it and realize we can't get people to buy into this because we don't have the adaptive capacities to allow this to be an acceptable way forward. So there are all sorts of interesting pitfalls and traps and potential loops that we find organizations have to go through. But this at least provides a framework. Perhaps the hardest thing is what happens when you get in the room with an innovation team, which is where we do our work in facilitating, and come against these dynamics of groups of people who are certainly not the usual suspects, right? They're a group of people who've probably never worked together before, board members, artists, staff members, outsiders. And there's an interesting trajectory. Um, if you can look at what happens in these projects, like on these two axes, you see I love simple graphs, you could say, what level of agreement did we come out with? Was it low or high? And what level of adaptive potential does the strategy have that we came up with? Is it low or high? We tend to start off down here, because there's a relatively high level of agreement at first, because we haven't done anything. And that, but as we start to think about it, and we really start to think about adaptive possibilities, the stakes go up, and the level of agreement rapidly goes down. Because this is conflictual work. Some people want to maintain business as usual. Others are gung-ho for the most wild experimentation. So there's a much lower degree of agreement and much more tension. In fact, there's a Halloween type of heat that comes into the room, I think, at that, at that stage. And a lot of arts organizations find that pretty difficult. A lot of us are incredibly passionate about our work, but find it hard to choose between ideas. We're rather conflict-averse. It's one of the things that we find time and time again in arts organizations. So what we really want to happen, and what every organization wants to see happen, is that that team is capable of continuing to develop the adaptive potential to a point where there is sufficient agreement that we can actually launch something. That's a breakthrough strategy. And I think that's the optimal trajectory through this kind of space. I'd like to believe that the simplest way forward is to go from there to there. Uh, but human nature is not like that. <laughs> and I'm not sure if you don't have the heat in the room, you'd ever actually come up with the really distinctive, original, discontinuous strategy that you're looking for. But what I'm sad to say more often happens is that once the heat gets turned up, organizations run for the exits. And there are <coughs> a variety of exits, I think. Perhaps the worst is when you end up saying, we can't agree on anything. Uh, I call that stalemate or an impasse. Sometimes you hand it off to others and say, huh, we, we just couldn't get any further with this. It was too much heat, so we just let go. Perhaps more frequently we find that what happens is when the heat goes up, people rush to agreement. They push to the right really hard. And as they do that, the trade-off is that the level of adaptive potential goes down and you end up with a compromise. 
mildly adaptive, but really not all that different from what we've done in the past. And even more so, sometimes organizations just rush for consensus and say, at least we could agree on something. We all came out of the room after six months saying, we agreed on something, but it was so tiny bit different from what we've done before. It really has no adaptive potential. These are the pitfalls we try to avoid, and our frameworks, if they work, help organizations go on up to that breakthrough change. We have a number of programs, as Betty was saying. The Innovation Lab for the Performing Arts is now actually in its seventh round. 26 organizations have been through it now. And we're in the second round of our museum lab, uh, working nationally with organizations across the country. And New Pathways for the Arts has been in seven or eight cities, uh, just opened in, in Cincinnati, and we were halfway through the first phase here in Chicago. Uh, and we also run Arts Forward, because while we think it's important to work with individual teams and organizations that are adaptive or want to become adaptive, we have also to move the dialogue about innovation and adaptive change from the margins to the center of our discourse. That's the mission statement for Arts Forward, to move that dialogue from the margins to the center of our discourse. Uh, the Innovation Lab, I'll just share one framework with you because it's the one that Denver Center went through. You can see there the three phases, and we deliberately time this intensive retreat, as we call it, the phase two, after about five months when the momentum would normally fall away. And then in phase three, we put all this emphasis on prototyping and evaluating. The idea is that by the time an organization comes out of this 10 to 11 month program, they're in a balanced position huh, to make a decision about launching this innovation and going to scale. What we find, interestingly, is that they're in a really good place to attract new funding for that strategy because it's not just a wild idea. It has been tested and refined and it's been shown to have some kind of public value at the same time, it remains a new project, and funders always want new projects. So it's, it's a fantastic device to get organizations to be in a place where they can bring new resources to the table, earned revenues as well as contributing. And Arts Forward, as I mentioned, is a place where we try to diffuse ideas and stories and leadership in the field to the wider sector so that hopefully we'll reach a tipping point where there is enough dialogue and enough early adopters of innovation and adaptive change that it will start to become part of the way we think about the sector. And maybe innovation as a, an organizational discipline uh, will be recognized is, as it, what it is in my view, which is the, the major new discipline that will enter the arts sector over the next 20 years. But it's, it's, it's difficult work. It's really tough work, though I think it's, it's, the, it's the real work um, of innovating and of changing to ensure our organizations have real relevance and impact in the future. I wanted to end just with a lovely poem of Wendell Berry's, which captures that, I think, in a way. He says, it may be that when we no longer know what to do, we've come to our real work, and that when we no longer know which way to go, we've begun our real journey. The mind that is not baffled is not employed. The impeded stream is the one that sings. Thank you very much. That's my spiel. Thank <laughs> you.